Hi, I'm James Verdeer, and welcome to the American Institute of Biological Sciences Bioscience Talks, a forum for integrating the life sciences. On the second Wednesday of each month, we discuss the latest bioscience publications. And as a reminder, if you'd like to read more, point your browser to bioscience.oxfordjournals.org. For this episode, I'm joined by Dr. Dan Salkeld, an ecologist at Colorado State University. Dr. Salkeld studies zoonotic diseases, which are illnesses that can be transmitted from animals to humans. And in particular, his work is focused on plague, which is the disease responsible for the Black Death in the Middle Ages. Now, today, plague primarily affects a number of animal hosts, including prairie dogs, which are what Dr. Salkeld studies. But the disease's ecology may be helpful in another way. The hope is that plague can serve as a model for other diseases, and that by studying plague, we can glean insights into why, how, and when diseases like Ebola and Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome will spill over into human populations. The implications are obviously huge, so let's get straight to the interview. Uh, Dr. Sokol, thank you very much for being here today. Great, thank you. Okay, and just to get us started, you know, I was hoping you could give us a little bit of a background on just what are zoonotic diseases and what are some of the major ones that we've seen spill over into human populations recently? Okay, so um, zoonotic diseases are pathogens that basically are maintained and, and transmitted in a wildlife host population. Um, but occasionally, uh, those pathogens can spread from the wildlife host into humans um, and then possibly into human populations onwards. So classic examples recently were the Ebola outbreak in um, West Africa in 2014, which spread from some wildlife reservoir host, um, infected people. And from there, there was a chain of transmission from person to person. And, and we are all aware of what happened there. Other diseases like uh, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome or Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, so MERS and SARS um, that have emerged from the Middle East, um, from camels, we think. Um, and then SARS came out in the Middle East from, um, we think, a chain from bats to civet cats to people. Um, so these things are increasingly in the news, uh, an increasing problem, partly because we have a, um, a world that is shrinking in terms of uh, transport. So people can get from West Africa to, for example, Texas uh, with Ebola um, fast enough for that to become a problem in the new environment. Okay, and obviously, you know, we're talking about diseases that haven't just come out of nowhere. They've existed in the animal host um, for some period of time. Uh, could you describe briefly sort of that cryptic phase? What do we know about it, or do we know much about it in most diseases? Um, so I think, to me, that's one of the most interesting questions. Um, there's two events here. There's the maintenance of the, of the pathogen within its wildlife population. So this, um, whether it's Ebola kind of um, percolating through bat hosts or some other unknown um, host species um, or MERS that's existed in camel populations for um, upwards of two decades, um, that's really interesting. And it often goes unknown um, by human or public health agencies. Um, and then you have this issue of a, a spillover. So it has to go from that normal host into a human. So something new is changing or something different is happening. Um, and whether this has happened you know, repeatedly over time, but the, it, it doesn't take off and doesn't start spreading in the human population, or it's not diagnosed properly, so it's some kind of unknown fever, um, or it's, it's fizzled out in, an, in a remote community. Uh, this might have happened repeatedly. Um, what is the changing now is that you get the, um, the maintenance, then a, a spillover, and then this, um, this spread into human populations. And it, does it tend to be the case that public health officials, you know, don't have a really solid awareness of what's happening in that cryptic phase? Um, I think it often depends. Um, it would depend on whether the pathogen is of huge public health significance. Um, but as an ecologist, we, we always like to resort to this, you know, phrase that ecology is complex and, and many different interactions and, and feedbacks. Um, and so it's very difficult to get a handle on um, zoonoses. So even um, things like West Nile in the United States, uh, since it emerged in 1999, um, things like Lyme disease, things like plague, um, have a bunch of different ecologies depending on where you live, depending on where the host populations are, depending on where the people's interactions are. Um, and it's very difficult to even come up with a simple uh, one-size-fits-all um, answer to where the diseases are, are being maintained. And your work is focused on plague within prairie dogs. Can you kind of describe that ecosystem as sort of an example of how this might work? Yeah, so um, prairie dogs are um, this common ground squirrel in the western United States um, with a bunch of controversy attached to them. You either love or hate them, um, but they have these huge populations. Um, and plague is um, a bacterial disease caused by um, Yersinia pestis, um, it's from Central Asia. Um, it's famous for the Black Death that you know uh, um, 
hugely impacted medieval Europe. Um, and it arrived in the States around the turn of the 20th century, so around 1900. Uh, came from Asia, arrived through San Francisco or other Pacific ports, um, and it's now enzootic, so that's kind of it's resident in um, mammal populations in the Western United States. And prairie dogs um, really get decimated by it. So if plague arrives in a prairie dog colony, 99% um, of those prairie dogs will die within with the outbreak. And you know, kind of given that death rate, why do prairie dogs still exist in this area? Why haven't they all died off? Um, so, you know, these are really interesting questions. One of the answers for that is that, um, at least in, in current ecology, prairie dogs have these discrete uh, colonies in the landscape. So you can, you can walk out onto the prairie, um, onto a prairie dog colony, and it, and it may be anything from two or three to 200 or 300 hectares in size. Um, but it's, you can map it almost the edge of this kind of colony. And, and some people call them towns because it is almost analogous to a, a human town with uh, boundaries. Um, and what happens with plague is that if it arrives in a particular colony, it can wipe that colony out. Um, then there has to be this issue of how does it spread from one colony to another. Um, so persistence at the landscape level is probably um, hugely impacted by the fact that it requires some time to get from one colony to another. Okay, so you, you have that. And how, do, how does the disease travel from one colony to the other? <laughs> it's still a question of interest. So there's a couple of current um, theories. One is that prairie dogs might spread it from one colony to another. So they do migrate between colonies occasionally. Um, there's dispersal for breeding. Um, a recent paper suggested that when things are going badly for uh, prairie dogs, so for example, perhaps plague that's killing members of the family, then they will disperse and find um, a new location. Um, the other hypothesis is that it's transmitted by a different host. So for something like coyotes or foxes that might actually pick up fleas or infected carcasses and take them across to um, new um, destinations. Okay, and you mentioned you know, fleas as a possible vector. I, you know, I think many of us will be familiar with flea-based transmission of plague from what we learned in grade school or high school. Uh, but is that the only method of transmission or is it more complicated than that? Uh, it's very complicated, and that's one of the beauties of, of studying the plague system. There's a, a heap of complications, um, and I think that opens your eyes to a lot of other zoonoses that things are not always going to be as simple as a one method of transmission. So in the case of plague, there's uh, flea-borne transmission, so that's when a flea bites a host that's bacteremic, so there's a lot of bacteremia in the, uh, bacteria in the blood, um, and then it can transmit it to a new host when it bites. But it can also, um, the plague bacterium, once it's within a, a mammal host system, um, can travel to the lungs and then it becomes pneumonic, so it can be transmitted in um, aerosolized droplets. And it can also be septicemic, so contact with blood or infected tissue um, directly to another uh, animal or to another, to a human host can occur. So we have, um, and then a th another one is that possibly that an, a, a carnivore can eat uh, a plague infected carcass and it can um, be exposed to plague that way as well. And out of curiosity, that sort of raises the question for me, um, how do you study this? You know, it, it, obviously the prairie dogs are living mostly underground and, and even beyond that, there would be other difficulties, I'm sure. Uh, can you describe those briefly? Um, yes. Yeah, so prairie dogs do live underground um, and they are uh, slightly nervous of people, so they're not easy to trap. Um, but what we had the luck of doing on this project was um, looking at a, a big complex of uh, prairie dog colonies in northern Colorado on the Pawnee National Grassland. Um, and we essentially just monitored them for uh, four or five years. So we would check when colonies were active, and when suddenly they disappear, we would know the plague was there. Um, or we would find dead prairie dogs um, on the surface, which is a rare event. Um, but once you know that um, prairie dogs are dying, then you can suddenly... Um, establish all your monitoring protocols and start trapping um, really concentratedly so that you can work out what's going on uh, whilst an outbreak is happening. Okay, so you have a model of and a way of understanding plague in prairie dogs. And I'm wondering what that understanding can teach us potentially about other zoonotic diseases, things like Ebola, for example. Okay, so I think there's a couple of really interesting things from the plague system. One is that um, although prairie dogs are the ones that really get hammered by plague and, and have this almost 99% mortality once infected, um, they're living in an ecosystem or community ecology with other mammals. Um, and so one of the findings that we have got is that um, this other rodent that lives in the same places, so it uses prairie dog burrows, is called a grasshopper mouse. And it would appear that high numbers of grasshopper mice um, will kind of edge a prairie dog colony to the conditions where plague 
once it arrives, can take off and cause an outbreak. Um, and uh, it, it, it feeds the fleas that normally you like to eat on prairie dogs. Um, it will move fleas into, to a greater extent so that it spreads it across the prairie dog community. Um, and so it, if you are looking at plague for itself, it would be hard to find in, prairie, in grasshopper mice, um, but their role seems to have come out strongly. The other interesting thing to me is that when we look at a prairie dog plague outbreak, um, if you look at it with just prairie dogs in mind, um, they all die off, and then there's this big question of where do they live afterwards. Um, and yet what happens is if you look beforehand, if you have these studies that occur over several months beforehand, you look and find out that there are higher numbers of uh, grasshopper mice, um, there are good densities of fleas, and you have this whole lead up into the actual event. And what is interesting to me is that other events like the Ebola outbreak um, is that all our um, knowledge essentially comes from the point when we know an outbreak is happening. Um, so spillover has occurred from some kind of animal host into the human populations, um, and we can trace it back often to cases where perhaps there are bats involved, or perhaps there are chimpanzees involved, or perhaps there were antelope called dikers involved, because we know that the hunters or the people uh, found these carcasses um, in the rainforest. But we don't know um, how or what spread the Ebola virus to the dikers or the chimpanzees or the gorillas or whatever the case may be. Um, and I think that's a really interesting question of, it's like the tip of an iceberg. Um, we can see what's happening on the tick, but we have no idea what's going on underwater or how long it's been going on um, or what, what the dynamics are. So putting it in analogous terms, you know, this would be like a scenario in which if plague were to erupt in a human population, uh, we would probably go and look and find a bunch of dead and wasted prairie dog colonies. Um, but that wouldn't describe the ecology. Right. So um, in the case of human um, plague, it's often been associated with rats. Um, and what happens is you have a rat die off. The fleas from the rats are jumping onto people. Um, and in that case, the tropical rat flea likes to bite people. Um, and then they get plague. But we don't know whether plague was in the rat population beforehand or did plague jump into the rat population from some other um, source? So, for example, in, in Eastern Africa, um, we have plague outbreaks in Uganda or Tanzania, um, and we are finding it in um, populations that live associated with humans, for example, in their maize crops um, and small holdings, but we also find it in species that are living in um, intact, unaffected rainforest. And, and you know, it is a 50-50 guess of whether it's jumping from rat populations outwards or is it jumping from a rainforest to the small holding to people. Um, and it's these things, it, these are really hard questions to get um, because you have to be monitoring and surveying the system um, from the get-go rather than at the outbreak. So there's some chance at least that, you know, these diseases are smoldering in a population that's largely out of our sight. And then it pops over into the vector to human transmission. Is that what's going on? Yes, that's, I mean, that's what I think uh, might be happening. So, for example, to go back to the prairie dog system, it seems like um, if you use as much knowledge as we have gotten uh, upon the prairie dog ecology and the plague ecology, if we model that and put it into computer simulations, um, it turns out that without these other mice, um, it seems that plague could happily percolate amongst prairie dog populations um, for months, even years, without knowing that it's... Um, it's there. Um, and then when you have these other conditions, for example, a mild wet winter and uh, or high grasshopper mouse numbers, then suddenly it erupts. Um, and that is what goes from smoldering to a big outbreak. So it's the case that the grasshopper mouse, which appears outwardly to be a relatively small player, is actually sort of the driving force for the dispersal. That's at least one hypothesis for, for sure. Yeah. And would we expect to see similar things perhaps among, you know, Ebola or MERS or, or other diseases? Um, so I think the interesting thing with MERS was that as soon as we, uh, or as soon as people were aware that it was in human populations, there was this sudden um, surge of trying to identify where is the animal reservoir. Um, bats were the first kind of suspect because SARS, which is related to MERS, it's also a coronavirus, um, was found to have emerged from bats. In the case of East Africa and the Middle East, it seems that um, MERS was um, persisting in camel populations, or at least there's evidence of antibodies in camels from blood banks spanning 20 years. Um, so it's this case of one doesn't know until it's causing a, a, an infection. And, you know, even now we're coming up with new diagnostics and new tools that are able to identify pathogens um, to an extent that we, we couldn't even 20 years ago. So if we wanted to take some of this knowledge and we wanted to kind of get a jump on when spillover was about to occur, what would we look for? 
So I think um, I think the key point um, that I've taken from all this research is that you, you have to look at the system as a whole. So we have a tendency to always try and identify the major suspect. So is it camels and mirrors? Is it originally civic cats and SARS? Is it prairie dogs and plague? And yet I think what our research has found out is that these wildlife hosts are part of a system. And that's not surprising, um, but it's like one of those moments of you, when you realize that other ho other animals are affecting the abundance and dynamics of, of pe perhaps your main target host, um, then these can be as important as the hosts themselves. Um, and so when you're looking at these new emerging diseases, I think going back on working out how does how do the interactions work ecologically what are other predators doing that maybe are suppressing or um, affecting the host populations um, how do the host populations change in abundance or does their behavior change in response to ecological conditions um, there's this whole you know this appreciation of complexity that um, would help understand the, the conditions that are right for emergence of the disease and, and to your knowledge, is that is that sort of observational work going on um, with diseases like Ebola? I think to an extent. I think, uh, for example, the Ebola system probably drew a lot of attention into viral dynamics in, in tropical rainforests. Um, I think a lot of the attention, quite rightly, is on what happens in the human populations and how can we control it. Um, I don't know how much attention is being paid to working out what are the dynamics um, because it's really difficult in rainforest to work out what are dynamics. So, for example, one of the hypotheses might be that perhaps this persists in, you know, tree-living primate populations. But how on earth do you sample from tree-living primate populations that are nervous of people because of a history of hunting? Um, so these are always non-trivial. Um, it sounds so easy and yet logistically really difficult. So what's next for your research? Are you continuing to study the prairie dog population? Um, I think what we are really interested in is trying to understand how does this, um, the ecology of the wildlife hosts interact with the exposure in the human um, population. So um, why do people get plague when they do? Is it due to something like human behavior? Is it due to um, a culmination of ecological factors raising the risk? Um, do you have to have the two occur and overlap? Um, and I think it's really interesting for a lot of diseases. So for example, in Colorado, we have um, plague, tick-borne relapsing fever, Colorado tick fever, hantavirus, um, tularemia, all of these diseases um, that we have historically understood purely from the outbreak onwards. And I'm really interested in trying to find out how do these diseases um, spread and get transmitted and maintained in the animal populations and what causes the jump from uh, animals to humans. Great. And one last thing we chatted about that I wanted to get in the interview if we can was the way that it feels when you're studying these prairie dogs and one of the colonies suddenly goes dormant because it's been affected by plague. Um, could you give us a little bit of color there? The one thing I was going to say was uh, that um, standing on a, prairie, on a prairie dog colony after a plague event or whilst it is happening is an extremely eerie event. So um, prairie dogs are well known for this kind of chirping and, and barking towards each other. They communicate, for example, that a person is on a prairie dog colony. Um, and that's quite an amazing experience. Um, but being on a prairie dog colony when a plague has is decimating the, the animals. Um, so there are carcasses on the ground and there is absolute silence. It is a, um, literally you're, the hairs on the back of your neck stand up. It's very, very um, eerie. So where in previous weeks, say, you would have heard all sorts of alert signals that they were transmitting to each other about your presence. Now it's silent? Yeah, exactly. It's one of those almost like a, the classic Western feel that tumbleweed is rolling around and there's just nothing happening. And the absence of all those alarm calls, um, it just, yeah, chills the blood. I think that's a great note to leave it on. Dr. Salkeld, thank you very much for joining me. Thanks so much, James. It's been a pleasure to chat. And that concludes this episode of Bioscience Talks. Just a reminder, the journal Bioscience is published by Oxford University Press on behalf of the American Institute of Biological Sciences. Check the links below to read the article and feel free to leave us a comment or send us a message on Twitter. Talk to you next time.